We were ahead of all the Porsches, two of the Maseratis and all the Aston Martins. Camarati's car was moving up too, and things looked very good for us. The speed past the pits ran about 140 for the Corvettes, up to about 160 for the faster cars. Pulling out of the pits in this traffic was really something. Then about 6 p.m., the rains came and the track was flooded. Things really got rough out there. The Ferrari GT, driven by Blanton, crashed just after the Dunlop Bridge turn. The car was demolished, but Blanton was uninjured. A virtual wall of rain forced Kimberly's number one Corvette off the track at White House, and he flipped. Spilled gasoline caught on fire and burned the ignition wiring off the engine. If this hadn't happened, perhaps he could have made it back to the pits, and the car could have finished the race after a few repairs. But you can't repair a car on the course. It must get back to the pits. Not long after this, Windridge, traveling at 130 miles per hour, spun at the same treacherous White House section, bounced off the walls on both sides, and limped back to the pit area. Notice the sparks as the headlight wires hit the wet pavement. He was very fortunate to be able to get it back. It took about two hours to get it ready to race again. You can't race at Le Mans without proper lights. This is Tete Rouge Corner, 25 or 30 miles an hour when it's dry. It's down about 15 now. The oil and the rubber on the road mixed with the water made it just like ice. As it got darker, the course really got dangerous. Here's Corvette number three switching to special rain tires. The cars ran very well in the rain. Everyone was pleased. Our good windshield wipers helped a lot, too. Some of the open cars actually got water on the inside of their windshields. That plus water on the driver's goggles presented a real problem. The rain and the spray from the cars literally blinded you at times. John DeBian was driving his Ferrari beautifully. The fast car behind him was the little Abarth 850, driven by Condriel. He seemed to be going as fast on the wet track as he had on the dry. About this time, Trintignant, one of the favorites, retired his works Porsche after losing a valve. These were the hours that the Corvettes made their best showing. At the beginning of the storm, Fitch was in 13th place in Corvette number three. He found the other drivers were having more trouble with the wet track than he was, so he started to push. The Corvette handled just about as well on the wet track as it had on the dry. He found himself in a real struggle with the Europeans, especially the Porsches. The other drivers could easily recognize his four headlamps, but he passed the Porsches and they never seriously contested the Corvette position again. He even passed the leading Ferrari driven by John de Bien. In just four hours, Fitz jumped from 13th to 7th place. Incredible for Le Mans. Meanwhile, Lee Lilly and Fred Gamble and Camarotti's number four Corvette continued to pick up places. At the end of the first hour, they were 41st. By the end of the race, they were 10th. Our car, number two, was steadily gaining also. They lost too much time in the pits to seriously contend. At 4 a.m., the halfway point, 40 cars were left out of 55. The Ferraris were holding first, second, third, with the D-type Jag in fourth, the Aston Martin fifth, and in sixth, Tavano's Ferrari GT. Fitch was in ninth with his Corvette, two Porsches in tenth and eleventh, Camarotti's Corvette in sixteenth, and two of the new Triumphs in seventeenth and eighteenth. Because of the rain, the 108 mile per hour average was quite a bit slower than 1959's 115.6 average at the halfway point. Sunday morning, the weather cleared and it was a beautiful day.
Breakfast tasted mighty good after that nasty night. Dry clothes felt good, too. All in all, things looked a lot better. The spectators were all still there, over 200,000 of them. Mass early Sunday morning was very beautiful and a moving thing to see. I'm certain many prayers were said for the drivers. Our number two Corvette was still in the race and still picking up places. We were really punishing it too, but it was giving no trouble. Amazing after the beating it took on a spin. During the morning hours, the race changed considerably. The second place Ferrari went out with a dead engine. The Rodriguez Pilette Ferrari moved into second with the Aston Martin going into third. The Acuria Cos Jaguar, which had run so well during the night, retired with a broken engine. Next, Condrillier's Abarth 850, the last car of its making the race. Later in the morning, more cars retired. The Buford's Porsche, Bailey's Lotus, Ashdown's Lola, and the Bonnier Hill Porsche, which has made such a fantastic comeback during the night from 53rd up to 14th place. Porsche had a thoroughly miserable Le Mans, completely unexpected after their wins at Sebring and Targa Florio. With four hours to go, Corvettes two, three, and four were still picking up places, and we were pushing, believe me. You had to use a tire out of the trunk on each tire chain, like a true cross-country race. And after each refueling, the official sealed the tank. You can see the bales of hay along the roadside to protect both the spectators and the drivers. The four-foot walls along the side of many of the turns are not quite so soft. Here you get a good look at those famous sandbags. I was in that one myself. Had quite a job digging out. The Ferraris were still hogging the race. Two works car in first and second, then four GTs in fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, plus another one in tenth. Third place was Salvadori Clark's Aston Martin only competitive British car left in the race. People get tired of watching a 24-hour race, so there's a 24-hour carnival, too.